Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the first EVPA policy webinar of the year. Today's topic is Pact for Skills and EU Funding Opportunities, European Social Fund Plus, Recovery and Resilience Facility Erasmus Plus. My name is Bianca Polidoro. I'm the EVPA Senior Policy Manager, and I will be moderating this webinar together with my colleague Catalina Papari, EVPA Policy Associate. Given the high level of participation to today's, today's session, we will be keeping the participants to the webinar muted in order to avoid any noise or interferences. But we encourage you all to raise any questions you might have. You can find the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and you can write your questions in the question section at your, any point. Please do not forget to clearly to mention to whom you would like to address it. If for some reason your question has not been answered during the webinar, feel free to contact us via email afterwards and we will ensure the necessary follow-up. Last but not least, note that this session is being recorded, so you will soon be able to watch the recording and consult this presentation on EVPA's website. Now that these housekeeping details are clear, let me give you a quick word about the European Venture Philanthropy Association. EVPA is a membership organization currently gathering more than 300 members from all across Europe that are interested in or are practicing venture philanthropy and social investments. Our members include foundations, social investors, academics, financial institutions, and service providers. Our policy work lies on two pillars. First, as thought leader within the IMPA space, EVPA monitors and communicates important developments in the sector at the European and national level, and voices the concerns and expectations of its network to policymakers. Second, as a catalyst, EVPA connects relevant stakeholders and facilitates conversation and collaboration between them on key policy topics. Through our policy webinar series, we have reached many people since 2014, connecting policymakers and practitioners around key policy developments, such as social impact bonds and InvestEU program. If you are interested in these topics, all recordings and presentations are available on our website. At the end of this webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate if you could take two minutes to fill in this in. It is also an opportunity to let us know about a specific policy topic you would like to us to address in our 2021 policy webinar series. So don't hesitate to grab it. Today's topic is Pact for Skills and EU Funding Opportunities, ESF Plus, RRF, Erasmus Plus. We will discuss this topic with the five great speakers. Let me thank and introduce them. Marie Boschet, Policy Officer at the European Commission in charge of Social Economy in Directorate General Internal Market Industry Entrepreneurship and Small and Medium Sized Enterprises, where she coordinates the implementation of the Pact for Skills for the Proximity and Social Economy Ecosystem. Luca Juros, expert in the international cooperation, public policy, and education. He leads the European Commission's work on the European Education Area Communication. Anna Nikovoska, Policy Officer in the European Commission in DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. She is responsible for implementing the Pact for Skills, the first flagship action in the European Skills Agenda. Lubomira De Relieva, Policy Officer at the ESC in the European Social Fund Coordination Unit of DG Employment. Jessica Curtis, Senior Fund Manager and Head of Education and Health at Rating Ireland. She has 20 years of experience in the education, disability, and community development sectors. We will start the webinar with an overview of the Pact for Skills by Marie Boschet. Then, with the other three experts from the European Commission, we will explore the several EU funding opportunities for upskilling and reskilling under the three EU programs. Last but not least, Jessica Curtis will share a practical example of investment in education, upskilling, and reskilling. We will end this webinar with a Q&A session moderated by my colleague Catalina, followed by an EVPA conclusion. Before leaving the floor to our first speaker, I would like to bring your attention on the EVPA series of interview, Investing in Climate Neutrality and Social Inclusion. The EVPA policy team conducted these interviews with five high-level EU representatives from the European Commission. DG Employment, DG Grow, DG Regio, the European Investment Fund, and the European Investment Bank. 
in particular the first interview to the to DG, to the DG employment director general Jos Korte is on skills employment and job creation within a transition towards climate neutrality very much related to the topic of today after the webinar i suggest to take a look to the EVPA policy publication on our website for a deep dive reading on eu funding opportunities such as european social fund plus you might also be interested to our policy briefs and please note that the next one will be on pact for skills upskilling and reskilling investments and eu funding opportunities Lastly, we would like to invite you to check the EVPA call of action on the contribution for the Social Economy Action Plan's roadmap. The plan will be published by the European Commission at the end of 2021, and EVPA is actively contributing in the process of consultations. We encourage you to contact us uh, to express your thoughts and questions or to obtain further information about the position of EVPA on this topic. Now, let's start with our first speaker. Marie, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bianca. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here today with you to introduce to you the uh, Pact for Skills for the Proximity and the Social Economy Ecosystem. Uh, I think your members are, are very relevant um, potential participants to the Pact for Skills. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to present the initiative to you and a big thank you so to EVPA for the organization of, of today's webinar. So my presentation will be twofold in the sense that I will first introduce in general terms the Pact for Skills and then I will focus in particular on uh, the implementation of the initiative by the proximity and social economy ecosystem. So what is the fir first, what is the Pact for Skills? Um, the Pact is the first of the flagship actions under the European Skills Agenda and is uh, firmly anchored in the European Pillar of Social Rights. If we had to define it, we could say that it's a shared engagement model for skills development. It therefore promotes joint action uh, to maximize the impact of investing in improving existing skills, upskilling and training in new skills, therefore reskilling. Next slide. Um, the Pact for Skills was launched officially by the, under the German presidency in November 2020, and it aims at bringing different types of actors together uh, companies, workers, national, regional, local authorities, social partners, chambers of commerce, employment services into these upskilling and reskilling activities. Because basically all those players have a key role to play in the upskilling of the um, EU population. So in the context, of course, of the support to a fair and resilient recovery and also uh, of, the deliver, of the delivery on the ambitions of the green and digital transitions, the Commission invites public and private organizations to join forces and to take concrete action to upskill and reskill people in Europe. This initiative is, of course, building on other EU initiatives for cooperation that you might know, such as, for instance, the Blueprint for Sexual Cooperation on Skills, the Reinforced European Alliance for Apprenticeships, and the Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition. So the initiative started with a series of roundtables with industrial ecosystems, which are still uh, ongoing, and maybe my colleagues in uh, DG Ample will tell you uh, more about this. Um, these high-level uh, roundtables were chaired by Commissioner Schmidt and Breton, um, with representatives of ecosystems identified in the EU new industrial strategy. So for the proximity and social economy, this um, roundtable took place on the 30th of October. Next slides, please. So as I said in the beginning, uh, the Pact for Skills is an engagement model. Um, so what will uh, the Pact for Skills offer for uh, members and signatories? Well, the Commission will support the signatories of the PAC through uh, a set of dedicated services, um, a networking hub, which would include support in finding partners, uh, first meetings of the partnerships and promotion of the activities of the PAC members, a knowledge hub, which would include webinars, seminars, peer learning activities, 
and of course a guidance a guidance and resources hub um, but my colleagues from digital will also tell uh, more about this next slide please thank you so the next question is who can join the pact well the reply is kind of straightforward it's pretty much everybody because the initiative um, has been designed as to uh, really engage with any type of, of stakeholders or, or persons you can join the pact as an individual company or as a private organization a public organization you can decide to team up in a local partnership or in the context of industrial ecosystems or cross-sectoral partnerships so i have put a link of course to the um, application form to the pack for skills and uh, i hope we can circulate it in the chat box um, that would be great and all members of the pact signing um, to the pact must sign up to the charter and its key principles, which they agree to respect and uphold. So what are the those key principles? Uh, there are four. Promoting a culture of lifelong learning for all, building strong skills partnerships, uh, mentoring skills, supply, demand, and working against discrimination and for gender and equal gender equality and equal opportunities. Signatories of the pact are strongly encouraged to translate their engagement into concrete commitments on upskilling and reskilling, because these commitments will bring the key principles of the pact to life. So that was the general framework for the initiative. And I will now say a few words on the, the structure and the principles of the uh, implementation of this initiative for the proximity and the social economy ecosystem. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the high level roundtable for this ecosystem, proximity and social economy took place on, 30th, on the 30th of October. And it was followed by the organization of a series of experts roundtables between January and, and May 2021. So the first one we had uh, was late January in the context of a digital um, event of our uh, European Social Economy Summit. And it uh, focused on digital education and, and training. The second experts roundtables took place uh, in the context of the industry days in January and uh, was dedicated to the acceleration um, of the industrial transformation and worker skills development through worker cooperatives. And we're going to have a third one uh, at the end of April, uh, the 27th of April. I'm happy to be able to confirm it today. Um, this one, this round table will be um, designed and dedicated to our um, European Social Economy Regions members that I will explain on the next slide. And also to the members of uh, another initiative that we have uh, involving cities, the Intelligent City Challenge. So basically, these roundtables um, were really to uh, were really about to replicate the high-level roundtable at experts level, um, because um, there was really a need to um, discuss in more details about this upskilling and reskilling uh, activities on the ground, and we tried each time to identify a different set of of, of players uh, in reskilling and upskilling. So this is really the the approach uh, for the implementation of the Pact for Skills for this ecosystem. I just mentioned, so the third round table will be, um, will be involving the uh, European Social Economy Regions members. Uh, indeed, we, found, we find it very important to involve, uh, to involve those players, the local authority and the, and, the, and the regions, into the implementation of the Pact for Skills for the proximity and social ecosystem, because they have really a pivotal role um, in those upskilling and reskilling activities. This is why we have really focused uh, on, on them. And to do so, we have used this initiative, which is called the ESER, which, is, which has been running since uh, 2018 and which aims at creating a, a community, uh, a community of practitioners, a community of social economy practitioners uh, we, who gather in an interactive network at regional and local level. So because this initiative was mature enough and is a model case of co-design and co-construction of EU policies in social economy, 
we have decided to open um, the edition of the 2021 uh, call to to create a specific strand for the pact for skills within this initiative which really allows us to uh, create synergies between the two um, initiatives next slide please thank you and i was saying that uh, those round tables will take place until may uh, why may because um, in may we have uh, our European Social Economy Summit, uh, maybe you have uh, heard of it. This is a summit where the ecosystem will join uh, the pact uh, for skills and present that joint targets for commitments um, that have been discussed during the roundtables. Next slide, please. So um, if you're not already aware of it, I would really um, encourage you to, to have a look to this uh, conference. Um, this is going to be a very big conference uh, with 80 workshops and, and panels. Uh, we have high-level panelists. We have a fairly good representation of the, of the Commission College as well. Uh, and it is, of course, um, a, a preparation step for the uh, action plan for the social economy that Bianca just mentioned uh, in her introduction. Um, so if, if you're interested, I would really encourage you to, to join us on, on this date. Next slide. Um, I will stop there. I just put the uh, the various links to the initiatives and uh, the, the background information that I have mentioned today. Um, I would like just to thank you for your attention. Um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to present uh, the initiative to you because I really believe uh, EVPA members have a, a, a key role and a key potential to join the initiative. So I'll be very happy to uh, to work together with you. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marie, especially also for um, uh, for introducing the European Social Economy Summit. Also, BPA will be present there with a session on the, social, the, uh, uh, the uh, investors for impact and the EU funding opportunities. Uh, and I would like now to leave the floor to Luca uh, Euros. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Catalina and Tim and the entire team at the EVPA uh, at, at, for organizing this uh, this seminar uh, on this important topic. Um, I'm, I work in uh, DG Employment in the coordination of the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, and uh, I would like to present a little bit about the facility as well uh, as how it specifically can be used in the context of the Pack for Skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next one. Thank you. So the Recovery and Resilience Facility uh, provides over 670 billion euros in loans and grants to be used until 2026 uh, to support reforms and investments um, in, in two directions. So one, to, to mitigate the economic and social impact of the coronavirus pandemic. And then second, to, to, to help the transitions of our economies and societies uh, in, in the context of our green and digital changes, but also the need to become more sustainable, overall resilient, uh, and, and uh, uh, more prepared to the changing global environments. In this context, the facility is closely linked to the European semester. So it will provide assistance to the member states to address challenges um, that have been identified previously in the context of the European semester process, as well as those challenges that are th those measures and, and issues that contribute to these overall objectives. Next slide, please. Um, the facility is organized across six pillars. And um, if you take a look, it will become immediately apparent that all six pillars are fully in line with what we uh, have just heard from Marie on the on the aims of the Pack for Skills. So obviously uh, the facility aims to help with the green transition and digital transformation. But it also uh, aims to to support economic cohesion, jobs, productivity, competitiveness, and more widely social and territorial cohesion. In the context of the crisis, there is clearly a need also to strengthen resilience in this context on health, but also economic and social, as well as to support policies for the next generation. So all of the all of the plans that the member states will propose 
uh, and that the council will then adopt uh, will to some extent uh, uh, propose actions and the across these six pillars next slide please uh, to looking more in depth every uh, plan will need to address a number of horizontal uh, uh, priorities. So at least 37% uh, of the total expenditure of the plan will need to relate to climate objectives and at least 20% uh, will need to be linked to digital transitions. And uh, the same actions can uh, contribute to both of these uh, both of these. Uh, measures at the same time. So, so the, the specific uh, ways to count are, are identified uh, in all of the uh, supporting documents. And at the same time, all of the plans need to follow the do no significant harm principle, which uh, ensures that uh, the support does not uh, uh, in any way uh, go against the EU's and the member states' objectives in terms of sustainability, the environment and climate. Uh, at the same time, uh, the plans clearly uh, uh, have to support uh, the next generation, so youth and children, and uh, ensure that the most vulnerable do have a, a strong opportunities in the future, both in terms of social protection, but also their, their access to the labor market. Um, and while social expenditure is not one of, the, one of these targets along the lines of climate and digital transition, the plans, uh, uh, so the overall facility will include a mechanism to track this expenditure. So there will be a strong emphasis both on the economic questions as well as to, to, to questions related to social issues. Uh, the next slide, please. And now, how does it work in practice? So uh, every plan will be prepared uh, by the national authorities. The national authorities uh, will uh, need to consult the content of their plan uh, uh, on, on the content of their plan with uh, stakeholders, with the social partners. So uh, when the plans arrive uh, to the European Commission, they, they, they will include the summary of the national consultation process. Um, and the the plans operate according to the principle of performance based financing so that means that the commission will not be looking at individual invoices and uh, justifications of expenditures rather uh, the member states will commit to certain milestones and targets which will then serve as the basis for uh, payments uh, within the facility and the plans need to have because because of their size uh, which uh, is unprecedented uh, in the EU history for this kind of instrument. There needs to be a strong element of, of complementarity and synergies with the, with the other EU funding sources, the EU funds, ESF, ERDF, InvestEU, as well as with the funds coming from the national budget. So the RF, RRF will not replace the funding for measures that the member states have, would have anyway plan from the national budget. Now, all of these points horizontally uh, have been presented in the guidance on the recovery and resilience plans, including a set of EU level flagships. And uh, this guidance that can then identify, in, you know, go in depth on any of the topics that, that you may be interested in, in more detail. But perhaps for, for in, in our context here today, most relevant is the component and the flagship on upskilling and reskilling. Next slide, please. So the Commission has prepared uh, to help the Member States an illustrative component of one plan. And in that component, we presented some re examples of reforms for adult learning systems, vocational education and training systems, and digital skills, as well as specific investments. So that means trans, uh, so specific uh, fundings of, uh, of uh, various projects. In this case, the, the, the draft component illustrates how member states could invest in intercompany training centers to support small and medium enterprises uh, to meet their training needs because we know that their capacity for training is usually limited. Uh, furthermore, the VET centers of competence and overall investments in digital skills. These illustrations can be used in the design of the recovery and resilience plans. The next slide, please. Now, in our context, everything I've been saying so far is largely between the commission and the member states. So uh, the, the Commission does not, in this case, discuss directly with individual potential beneficiaries of the plan. But when the plans do 
uh, roll out when they when they are adopted by the council, uh, they will include a, a wide variety of measures which could be relevant for the pack force. Because obviously the digital and green transitions will include substantial reforms and investments related uh, to to areas that are linked to the pack for skills, and these reforms of uh, the skill systems from vocational education and training, adult learning, skill strategy, skills intelligence are all potentially relevant for the pack for skills. So what what we do encourage both the member states and and the participants here in in our in our webinar today is to reach out to to your counterparts in the national uh, administrations and to 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 check what the plans are. Uh, in, in this regard, and what kind of uh, efforts could be, what kind of opportunities could come up in the future? And uh, on the right-hand side of this slide is a recommendation the Commission has recently adopted to help the member states make the transition from the current labour policies, which focus on limiting the impact of the crisis. To limit the unemployment levels uh, so that they don't uh, uh, balloon, uh, to word the employment and labor market policies which can help the transitions uh, across the wage and hiring incentives, upskilling and reskilling, as well as the support of the public employment services. These measures again can provide an opportunity for the member states uh, to support the pack for skills. And finally, I just want to emphasize that we have presented these, these opportunities. So, next slide, this yellow slide, please. Thank you. Yes, so uh, the, these examples are not uh, specific for any member state. Uh, the Commission will assess every member state's plans in, uh, on its own merit and uh, will assess to their ex, uh, acceptability and eligibility. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. Now, please, Anna, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Now just allow me to turn on my camera. Uh, yes, so uh, I would like to focus on uh, the uh, um, Erasmus Plus for possibilities regarding uh, upskilling and reskilling and in particular the Pact for Skills. So if we go yeah, to the next slide. Uh, as, uh, can we go? Thank you. Uh, as you know, Erasmus, uh, the new Erasmus Plus will be built of three main key actions. Key action one that focuses on mobility, key action two on um, strategic partnerships, and key action three that uh, has more uh, specific calls uh, that are identified each year. And uh, today I would like to talk about key action two. And um, there we have three main types of partnerships, partnerships for cooperation, partnerships for excellence, and partnerships for innovation and this is um, exactly the, the the part type of partnership I would like to focus if we could uh, move to the next slide. So uh, the uh, Alliance for Innovation, Partnership for Innovation are divided into two lots. Lot one uh, focuses on um, cooperation between education and enterprises and here um, this lot is a, a, a merger between former sectoral skills alliances and knowledge alliances that we had in uh, previous uh, Erasmus Plus. It focuses on sectoral and cross-sectoral cooperation and also um, tries to, um, the aim of the, of the lot is to build bridges between higher education and VET and enterprises. Of course, the, um, we want the partnerships to look at the labor market um, side and uh, social innovation. And of course, the key elements are innovation, entrepreneurship, skills and labor market. Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. So what is the aim of lot one? So again, as I said before, cooperation between companies and education. And here we are talking about uh, corporal social responsibility to increase quality and relevance of skills that are provided. Um, about increasing the flow and creating knowledge uh, between companies and uh, education sector but also to strengthen the education sector and its proactive role in building innovation, in creating innovation, and then being able to transfer it, uh, especially in the, um, in the field of skills, skills development into the companies. Then if we can go to the next slide. 
so possible activities under the lot one uh, is boosting innovation, developing uh, entrepreneurial mindsets, uh, competences and skills, flow of knowledge between vet, uh, uh, vocational education training and higher education and companies, and identifying market needs and emerging uh, for, for uh, and emerging professions. What is important for uh, lot one is also that. Um, the program really aims to uh, build the partnership, strengthen the knowledge, strengthen the, the, the capacities of those uh, partnerships to deliver. Um, and like the whole Erasmus, it's not about really providing training, but looking at elements that can support uh, building training, uh, support building the systems, uh, support the cooperation. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, so, um, so I discussed before lot one. Now we are talking about lot two, which is a continuation of the sectoral skills alliance um, focused on the so-called blueprints, and uh, those blueprints are very closely linked with the with the pact for skills. Uh, as um, they are focusing on large sector uh, sector based european wide uh, uh, projects uh, and uh, all, uh, and now in this um, from 2021 we want to really focus on the industrial ecosystems as marie mentioned before like proximity and social economy is one of the 14 ecosystems that were re identified in the industrial strategy and there we want to um, uh, build um, and use the partnerships, use the, 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 the work that is done by the partnerships in the blueprint to be uh, input, to be a starting point, to be the, um, um, uh, let's say, catalyzer uh, starting point for the actions in the Pact for Skills. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, again, the aim of lot two, so blueprints, is to on one side look at uh, what is needed regarding skills, but on European level to analyze this and then um, propose uh, concrete trainings, propose concrete activities that could be then um, at, um, taken uh, up by region uh, on regional or local level level or by in nas on national level and then introduce in the mainstream uh, to uh, support the skills development in particular sectors. Uh, next slide please. So, um, in the blueprints, we are uh, talking about two approaches. On one side, we uh, want the partnerships to be uh, reactive, so to look what is happening uh, and also to prepare uh, and design uh, good um, training programs for continuing vocational education and training. So, for all those who are already on the labor market, finish the initial education, but need still um, support uh, uh, regarding skills development um, to uh, be prepared and to answer to the to the challenges that are um, uh, uh, appearing on the labor market but also to um, reach out to the main players to talk with them to see uh, how the, the, those programs could work um, and uh, be um, used by main uh, players in particular sectors next slide but we are uh, also uh, encouraging and wanting the blueprint uh, projects to be proactive. So to look at the, at the skills intelligence, to build skill strategies, to define uh, emerging occupational profiles, but also define what uh, quali uh, um, qualifications are required, what skills are uh, needed, but also to build a long-term pro uh, uh, programs, long-term actions that then um, could uh, use uh, the knowledge uh, uh, that that was uh, developed and built under the blueprints. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding timing, um, if I'm not wrong, today, in fact, the um, Erasmus Plus course and program guidance were published. So uh, you can go to the to the Erasmus Plus webpage and you will find the, the guidelines. So, in fact, uh, not in April, but in March, uh, we managed to publish the publish the, the program guidelines. Uh, expected deadline for applications. Um, 
Again, this information may be wrong because I put the slides two days ago, uh, but it should be around September. Then uh, uh, evaluation uh, process goes September, December to, uh, uh, this year. And the, um, the winners, the, the, those who will be granted uh, the projects, uh, will be able to, to start them um, from April 2022 with the starting dates May, June or, uh, or July. And of course now um, again with the with the publication of the program guidelines uh, this may vary a little bit but more or less uh, this is how the process will look like to apply and to uh, receive the grants. Thank you and I think that that's my last slide so uh, um, if you again if you have any questions I'm very happy to answer now I give uh, the floor to my colleague. Yes, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. We'll have time for questions afterwards. And now the floor is for Lugo Mira. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. In uh, this presentation, we'll look at uh, the last EU fund today in the presentation, the European Social Fund Plus, and what uh, it can do for skills in particular. A quick overview of uh, what this uh, part of the presentation would cover. We'll quickly look at what DSF Plus is, um, how it works, and uh, then um, we'll look at how it can support skills and, uh, of course, how you can get involved. If we can move to the next slide, what is DSF Plus? Just a quick recap for those of you who are not aware. It is uh, the first structural fund that was established with uh, the Treaty of Rome already in 1957. And since then, it's been the EU's key instrument for investing in people. It has uh, two missions. One is to improve employment opportunities uh, in the EU and um, secondly to contribute to economic, social and territorial cohesion and that puts it in the same uh, family as the other cohesion policy funds, the regional development fund, cohesion fund and just transition fund. As you, as you can see, the, the objectives are very similar to those of the RRF that uh, we saw uh, a few moments ago in Luca's presentation. If we could move on, thank you. A quick look at uh, the budget of DSF Plus for the next programming period, 2021-2027, that would be 88 billion euro. Importantly, the big part of it, the biggest part of it would be implemented through shared management. And we'll look in a moment what shared management means, but uh, basically through the member states like the RRF. Uh, but there will also be a part that would be implemented directly by the Commission, and this would be the employment and social innovation strand, which is the continuation of the employment and social innovation program that you're probably aware of. Now it will be part of the ESF Plus uh, with this budget. And here it may be interesting to mention that uh, the microfinance and social entrepreneurship axis that was a part of the EASY program will now move to the Invest EU window. But we'll look more at the EASY strand uh, in a minute. If we could move on, please. Now, as I mentioned, the biggest part of DSF Plus is implemented through shared management. For those of you who are not so familiar with it, um, I would like to quickly explain how this works because it's, it's important uh, in how you can access uh, ESF Plus resources. Now, um, shared management means that the implementation uh, of the fund is shared between the European Commission and the member states. And the member states, this can be national or regional authorities, depending on the constitutional setup of the country. And um, at the beginning of each programming period, so as we are now, beginning of uh, 2021, the Commission and Member States negotiate the new program. So it's called programming, and this means to agree on the priorities for investment, what the budgets would be, what actions would be funded. And um, once uh, this um, programming is completed, once these uh, ESF Plus programs are adopted, which uh, for the next programming period, so the 21-27 one we expect would happen by the end of this year, 
um, then the Commission is uh, responsible for monitoring, reimbursing expenditure, and is also ultimately accountable for the budget. But maybe even more important for you, the member states um, are then, so the national or regional authorities in charge of DSF Plus are then um, responsible for delivering what uh, actions have been planned. This includes selecting the concrete projects that uh, get funding and also paying the project organizers. Um, just to mention here in, in this uh, period of programming where the priorities and budgets are agreed, an important element uh, is uh, the, the recommendations and an analysis of the European semester just as for the RRF, as well as um, taking into account EU-level policy initiatives like uh, the PACS for Skills. Now, two other important principles of shared management partnership. This means that uh, decision-making is joint between the Commission and member states, of course, but also uh, social partners and civil society have, have to be involved uh, in a meaningful way in, in all, the, all the stages of programming and implementation. Uh, so this uh, is important for you as stakeholders and uh, then there's the principle of co-financing which uh, means that some member states need to give some national co-financing to add to the um, to the eu uh, resources in order to ensure ownership now what kind of support can the ESF Plus provide? It can be either grants or financial instruments. The grants are the biggest parts. As you can see, financial instrument is around 1% and we expect this to remain for the 21-27 period. For in terms of grants, they can either support uh, projects that support the ecosystem and social entrepreneurship and uh, for the current period, almost 1 billion has uh, been invested uh, across the EU. Um, under DSF uh, for social entrepreneurship and the social economy, but also grants can, of course, um, also be given for projects that are implemented by social enterprises in any of the policy areas that the ESF Plus uh, will support, so that's employment, social inclusion, education and skills. A few words on financial instruments. These uh, are mostly loans and microloans, but there are also some guarantees and equity and they are mostly in uh, the area of uh, employment um, for example business creation but there are also some in the area of education and skills such as student loans and uh, a few messages on the 21-27 period what's new basically a uh, very important uh, novelty is the possibility to combine grants and financial instruments in one operation. So, for example, you can have a microcredit scheme using a financial instrument and then in the same operation have a grant for uh, entrepreneurship training. And this is something that's new. Then uh, the rules have been simplified and another novelty is that um, a member state can decide to transfer up to 50% of their ESF plus uh, resources to invest you to their member state compartment. If we could uh, move on, please. Now let's look more closely at how the ESF plus can support skills. This is an overview of the ESF plus uh, objectives. There is an overarching one, which is a more social and inclusive Europe, implementing the European pillar of social rights. And then it's translated in these 13 specific objectives in the areas of employment, education, training and social inclusion. And skills are actually relevant for all of these uh, three policy areas. Uh, it can be relevant under, uh, they can be supported under employment, access to employment for job seekers or under social inclusion, uh, equipping people uh, in vulnerable situations with skills they need to be integrated in the labor market. But uh, of course, especially in the area of education and training where we have uh, specific objectives uh, to, 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 um, to support and, uh, and improve uh, education and training systems, also to provide equal access um, to education and training and then there's a specific objective on um, specifically looking at uh, reskilling and uh, upskilling anticipating, anticipating change and new skills requirements so it covers the entire education training cycle and what's important to mention as well is that the sf plus can both support people directly and reforms and we'll look at a few examples now if we could move to the next slide, please. 
So a few examples just to illustrate uh, what uh, the ESF Plus uh, has supported, what the ESF has supported so far and what it can support in the future. It can be business incubator. It, so these are examples of, uh, of past projects that have already been implemented. So business incubator to increase a new SME survival rate in Denmark or entrepreneurship classes in school or specific entrepreneurship training and support for people in vulnerable situations, unemployed women or migrants or young people that can be combined with loans or grants for participants to, to start their own business. Um, more training for, for people in vulnerable situations to work in, in social enterprises, such as agricultural social enterprises in Slovenia. And as we saw, the ESF can um, plus will be able to support not only people directly, but also reforms. So this can be developing new skill strategies or um, introducing skills forecasting systems or reforming curricula. If we can look at the next slide, please. Yes, um, an important element of the SF Plus would be social innovation, which is defined as uh, innovation that's both social in ends and means. And all member states would need to dedicate resources to social innovation. And this is an element both of the shared management part, but also of the part under the, the easy strand, which we will look at uh, now. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. These are the operational objectives of the Easy Strand. So th this is the continuation of the Easy program that uh, I assume you are familiar with. And uh, the objectives uh, that you see in blue are the ones that uh, continue the, um, to an extent the what what's been possible under the the Easy program, um, social the the microfinance and social entrepreneurship axis. So there will be a part that remains in the easy program. However, as we saw, the it, it it's mostly transferred to the invest EU social window. If we could move to the next slide, please. Yes, here you can see the eligible actions under the new easy strand, which can be analytical policy implementation, capacity building, communication and uh, dissemination. And uh, the eligible entities could uh, the list is is quite wide. So EU member states, but also any legal entity that's created under EU law. And, and if we can look at the next slide, please. Yes, how can you get involved? Like um, like I mentioned, the under the principle of shared management, the coastal proposals and project selection for the biggest part of the ESF plus under shared management is in the hands of uh, national or regional authorities. So for any project that you have in mind, you need to get in touch with them. And here is a link of uh, where you can find who they are in your member state, including uh, contact details. And um, maybe look at, at the last bullet point uh, for the easy strand, which is directly managed by the Commission. The codes are, will continue to be launched by the European Commission. And uh, here are the links where you can find them. And uh, for the ESF Plus, sorry, can we go back? <laughs> Just to, to re reiterate that for the ESF Plus um, entirely, including the easy strand, the programming is ongoing now, including consultation of partners and stakeholders. So I encourage you to uh, get involved. Thank you. And if we could move on to the conclusions. Just to recap, uh, the ESF Plus will remain the EU's key instrument for investing in people, including skills, and uh, that for the new programming period 21-27, the programming is ongoing, but uh, we expect it to be finished uh, by uh, mostly by the end of this year. The majority of the most of the part of the of the resources will be implemented through shared management, so through national or regional authorities in partnership with uh, the Commission and relevant stakeholders. So their involvement, your involvement is very important in this process. So both uh, in, in, the, in the role of stakeholders, but also future project beneficiaries, um, we encourage you to get in touch with your managing authorities. For the Easy Strand, uh, even though it, it, the Easy program is now a part of the ESF Plus, it would remain directly managed by the Commission. Thank you. I think that was all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lubomira. Uh, now we can leave the floor to Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. 
Hello, everybody, and thank you for having me. Um, I am speaking to you from Ireland. We really appreciate the invitation um, from Rethink Ireland. I am going to speak to education in the context of um, skills, skill, upskilling and reskilling and how we implement our education focused funds. You can go to the next slide, thank you. So we're a venture philanthropy fund. We provide cash grants and then we provide capacity building business supports and programs to support those innovations that we um, that we support and then every euro that we raise in philanthropy is matched by the government of ireland by the dormant accounts funds next slide please so we are looking to create an inclusive equal and sustainable ireland our mission is that within Ireland we'll identify the best social event uh, innovations and provide that support I spoke to earlier. Um, we are hope we hope and we do have an impact by creating an evidence base for the awardees that we work with. We also want to improve as well as prove our social impact in Ireland, and we do that with um, an impact management framework that is underpinned by the principles of social return on investment. We're also working with academic partners and awardees to develop um, information on the social impact of our work. If you could move slides, please. So within Rethink Ireland, we have a strategic plan that has five strands. One of those strands is education. And that's what I'm to speak to you about today. The primary aim of our education strand is that we support more students to progress along the national education framework across their lifespan. So paying attention to the fact that people learn at different times of their lives and have opportunities to learn maybe later in life than, than the best opportunities they had earlier in life. We also want to support more people experiencing disadvantage to progress into employment through these strands. And we hope to support more people to lift them out of poverty and often bring their families with them as a result. And finally, we intend that Ireland will become a learning society and that we'll contribute to it. Next slide. So why do we invest in innovations in education? So most recently, we are investing in these innovations to respond to the impact of COVID-19. As you know, education has been um, devastated by the impact of COVID-19 and people haven't been able to spend time together so the social impact is also there. Um, we invest also to support the implementation of 21st century skills across the lifespan like digital upskilling, like resilience building and we also find that by investing in education and bringing these innovators together we are creating peer networks that allow that leads to even further innovation um, and perhaps towards systemic change at times. We invest also to create an evidence base so that we can offer public education on what works for our education system and what can work and what we can work towards to bring us closer to the labour market. And then finally, we do so in order to improve and scale great ideas. So some of the ideas that we support um, develop even further and become na national or international models of excellence. Next slide, please. So to date, we have invested 22 million, in, million euros in our education strand. That is one third of our 65 million euro overall fund. These funds in education are made up of 50% philanthropic funding, which is self-raised by most of the awardees. And then the other 50% comes from the Government of Ireland to the Dormant Accounts Funds. We open the funds, as I said, in response to pressing needs. And our goal is to support 25,000 people per annum to have equitable access to and support for their education and their well-being. This year alone, sorry, next slide, please. This year alone, um, we have managed to support even more than that, up to 97,000 people because of our ability to offer boosted supports to our education awardees, which allowed them to pivot very quickly when the impact of COVID-19 started changing the way that we engage with education. Um, I'm going to just skip this slide because I speak to it anyway, if that's okay. Thank you. So I wanted to give you a snapshot of the type of projects that we work with within our education funds. So 
One of those projects would be called Tech to Students, and that's where two of our awardees came together, a university and a youth organization came together to create a campaign to encourage corporate organizations to contribute laptops and other digital devices to um, young people who were experiencing disadvantage. And that happened obviously very quickly and as a result of COVID-19. Another organization that would be interesting with regards to early, early intervention and skills building is a community development organization called Midland Science. And they were a very localized organization building interest in science in um, a rural setting. But when they pivoted during COVID-19, they built their audience up to 22,000 people who were engaging with their online education um, science podcasts and YouTube casts and so on. And I can share examples of those um, as, as we go on. But they, they got international notice very quickly. They are working with the University College of London. They're working with the Science Foundation of Ireland um, to expand beyond their uh, Midland roots. And then there are other projects that I can speak to, like um, the Moy Ross Education Support Project. It was a small project that started with us as an innovation around offering psychological supports to families and children in the school setting. So bringing both, both family and uh, parents and children together. And in that particular part of the country in Moy Ross, the population has experienced a lot of social deprivation. And as a result, there, have been, there has been intergenerational educational um, disadvantage. And this project was a small, in a small way trying to change that for both the children and the parents. And as a result of the success of that project, they have received follow-on funding from a number of resources and have managed to create a community centre um, in the Moiras area where both psychological resources and educational resources and allied medical health resources and education all come together under the one roof. And it's something that is attracting adults that wouldn't would normally have had negative experiences of education so those are interesting kind of um scale and geographical and then digital um related projects that i thought might be of interest to you in addition to that we are spending some time developing three academic evaluations with our partner in nui galway the unesco family unesco family resource center and with them, we have discovered that the implementation of these innovative novel uh, models have improved the education of the students in a way that is 15% higher than the existing um, state support system for marginalized young people. The research is always also telling us that we need a new model for educational pro progression with supports an individual and structural level. And that is to help people um, progress to employment and or progress to ways of learning um, to bring themselves closer to the labor market. So that's anything from working towards apprenticeships or um, <clears throat> working with mentors early on in, this, in the school system to help people move towards the labor market and be ready for it when that opportunity arises. Um, another um, fund that we opened recently is called the Education Innovation Fund. We are just in the selection process of that recently, but I thought it would be of interest to share with you the type of projects that are applying to us. So about 17% of the projects that are applying are in relation to transitions in education. So from secondary, secondary school to third level, looking at how to support people who experience disadvantage to make that transition. We're also, we also have about 33% have applied with a focus on well-being, STEM, as I mentioned before, and specifically digital upskilling. And then 50% of the applicants were focused on reversing the effects of poverty and educational outcomes. So in Ireland, we have a 25% um, of adults have problems with their literacy skills. So this is something that we have found is a, an outcome of an effect of poverty on the on the population. So we are looking for projects that will be able to address that um, gap in achievement. Um, we can move on to the next slide, thanks. So I just wanted to read to you um, just a couple of lines in the words of three different beneficiaries of our projects. And if you would like to know more, I can um, share a YouTube clip about a certain um, 
projects if you'd like. So <clears throat> one of the projects said that self-confidence and one of the students, excuse me, self-confidence and study skills that I developed through my project activities helped me to transition to third level education successfully. I never expected that. A second person said I would have left school with no formal certificates. I didn't even have a junior cert, which would be the formal education that we have at, at the age 15 in Ireland. I didn't have a leaving cert and now I'm more than halfway through my second year of degree. So this project is absolutely fantastic for me. And the next one then is from an adult with intellectual disability. I am the first child in my entire family to go to Trinity College. This is an amazing experience for me. And I got to become a student mentor to the first year students this year. Other projects that we work with are specifically working towards employment, um, employment, gender specific employ, um, address, excuse me, we have a gender specific fund called Manoana Heron that is looking at female employment and what is necessary in the social space in order for female employment to be successful. And we are currently developing with the donor a fund that um, is specifically focused on the age group 18 to 34 to bring them closer to the labour market and work with industry partners on that. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was a good um, flavour of the kind of work that we're doing in the space. Yes, thank you very much, Jessica. This was an excellent flavour. Thank you for this amazing presentation. And now I can leave the floor um, to my colleague, Catalina, for starting the Q&A session. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you, everyone, for the very interesting conversation that we had uh, and all your presentations. Actually, we have plenty of questions. And just as a disclaimer, we will tackle all of them also offline and you'll receive your uh, all the replies by email. Just because of matter of time, we selected the one, two for each um, of our speakers. And uh, maybe, Marie, we can start with you. And uh, one of our attendees is uh, interested in the role of investors under the PAC. Will an investor be more likely to get funded when it signs the PAC? Yes, thank you. Um, I think this would be more a question for my colleagues in, uh, in DG Ample. What can I say? Uh, what I can say for the uh, ecosystem, the proximity and social economy, is that investors definitely uh, fall under this ecosystem, so they will be free. But for this particular question, I think I need to, to uh, pass uh, the floor to my colleagues in DG Ample. Okay, uh, who would like to start question? Yeah, I think I may answer this question. So, um, joining the pack definitely gives uh, advantage because organizations can learn from each other, exchange. But uh, at this stage right now, and because also packed, uh, the majority of the funds are managed by national authorities, we do not plan to have you know like a very clear criteria if you are a member of pact you have additional five points because that also would not be in line with uh, transparency and uh, ensuring that everyone has the same access however definitely joining the part gives the benefit of uh, being able to exchange being more prepared uh, learning more and finding uh, var various um, opportunities and funding opportunities Okay, and linked to that, we also have a question. Can an organization sign the pact and only receive non-financial support? Um, so uh, by signing the pact, it means that the, mem uh, that the organization that joins is um, of course, receiving this uh, access to the to the other members, to the support that we are um, giving and the support that also Marie mentioned in the three hubs, so knowledge hub, um, a guidance hub and networking hub so uh, this is definitely non-financial support this is more uh, exchange learning from each other uh, being better prepared understanding what is happening both in the area of upskilling reskilling but also in the eu funds uh, and also uh, how to build quality partner skills partnership Okay, great, thank you. Um, Marie, regarding the SR for skills, I think uh, this uh, will definitely be a question for you. What does the SR for skills trends provide apart from simply being uh, part of the signatory for the PAC? Who can participate in the third PAC for skill expert roundtable in April and May? Okay, um, so 
the yeah the link with the ESR. So the third one in April, the third roundtable that we have is only opened to um, uh, the members of this initiative on on, on regions, the ESR. Uh, and also the members of the Intelligent City Challenge, um, because uh, we have decided to have a clear focus on, on public authorities at local level. So cities, regions and local authorities are very well uh, placed. Um, this being said, um, if uh, there is interest for other roundtables from other uh, stakeholders, we would be very happy to, uh, to explore this possibility. Um, so, if some of your members believe that uh, there is an appetite to do so, uh, they just shouldn't hesitate and contact me and we could definitely explore uh, what we can do together. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Lubomira, a uh, question regarding ESF Plus. Can a private investor active in the social field co-invest under ESF Plus? And, in, and if yes, could you please provide us uh, with an example? Yes, uh, thank you. It is possible. I'm afraid I cannot give you an example at the top of my head, but um, in in general, what I can say now, if you want, I can I can dig uh, a bit uh, in our project and see what has been done and uh, through uh, the Catalina maybe we can uh, share some examples but what I can say now is that uh, in general the the design of the of the project of of the operations is really done at uh, the national or regional level by the authorities so it's not something that we regulate at the EU level. And regarding the timeline, uh, you touch upon this um, this question in your presentation, but maybe if you can clarify a bit, are the ESF Plus and Easy Calls already launched? No, not yet. Uh, unfortunately, the the regulation, so the legal basis, uh, has not yet uh, been. Uh, so yeah, it's not yet in force. Uh, we hope this would uh, be the case uh, by June, July this year. And uh, so for, for the ESF Plus, uh, member states are, so for the shared management part, member states are progressing at different speeds, but uh, we believe that uh, for most, uh, by the end of the year, uh, um, this process should be ready. And for the easy strand uh, that is uh, directly managed by the commission, um, the work program, we expect uh, that it would be adopted by, by this summer. And then uh, the first calls would, uh, would uh, be launched uh, straight after, basically. And uh, um, my colleagues who, who work on this uh, said that um, especially the operating grants would follow immediately. And that's uh, the information on the timeline. Encouraging. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Jessica, um, we have a question for you regarding the collaboration with uh, the Irish national authorities. What is the most important element of your collaboration and uh, how did you manage, manage to engage in a partnership with the national Irish authorities? So I just want to check with national Irish authorities. I'm assuming that means the government of Ireland. Probably. Um, <laughs> So the, the organization was founded by the Irish CEO, Deirdre um, Mortel, in 2016. And it was f founded with, in agreement with the um, government of Ireland at the time. The um, government was looking at creating um, an opportunity for funding, uh, building up philanthropic funding with their support to address social problems of the time. And it has expanded since then. So it was a small, one million fund to begin with and it has now built up to 65 million and I suppose the reason that it works so well is because we have been able to prove and share our impact year after year with um, the government and we also involve them when we we are designing funds we do a lot of research and scoping initially <clears throat> and we invite the various relevant departments to join us in that journey okay and uh we also have a question regarding EU funding. If you apply for EU funding and uh, what were the main challenges and uh, if you would do anything differently when applying in the current pre period, if you intend to apply or not. I'm sorry, is that is that question for Rethink Ireland or is it from the perspective of an applicant? 
I think for for perspective of, of an applicant and uh, yeah, I think it can it can be yeah. both replied for for someone from DG Employment, but also for you for from your own experience. Okay, so as a fund manager, one of the things that we look for is that there's a clear idea of what type of social impact the project wants to have, and that that has been that decision has been made in consultation with beneficiaries, if possible, and if not, most definitely with their consideration in mind. Also, it's very while we support people at early stage, it is still very important that they understand and have done their research on where the evidence base has been tested for their innovation previously and if it hasn't that they have at least trialed it in some way in Ireland to show us that there is a need for this innovation. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's very clear. Uh, Luca, um, we will jump to RRF now. Uh, how can private investors align on and support the RRF national plans? Uh, especially under the component of skills, upskilling and reskilling? Um, all of the plans will be tailor-made to, to, to a certain country. So it, it, if, if I was, if I was uh, among our audience members and thinking about this, what I would suggest is um, try to reach out to your usual counterparts in the national authorities if you are in regular contact or otherwise to the representative organizations to try and, and get hold of, of what the government is planning to do. Um, those plans would normally always include um, uh, the bodies that would implement the plan and, and, and establishing those contacts would, would, allow, would allow me uh, as a representative to, to, to make sure that, that my contacts are in place to roll out activities immediately. From what we have seen in the plan so far, every single country has a skills component. Um, I do need to emphasize the Pact for Skills because it is a fairly new initiative, doesn't appear in all the plans as such, but we do see that the elements of the Pact for Skills are there. So um, the, these informal contacts to make sure that you're on top of what the government is planning to roll out uh will be the best there is no one size fits all in, in the rf thanks okay, and the very link to what you said now how can we access the contact names list and details in each country to check the eligibility and to find <laughs> more information about uh, i can tell you one thing that we are trying to do in every contact we have with the member state is to say reach out and stay in touch with your social partners and with your stakeholders um and then that's why it's one of the elements that we're, that we're going to be looking at is uh, how those contacts have been done, because we know the plans will be stronger if that's happening. Unfortunately, um, the legal framework does not um, make that a condition. Uh, and, um, and, and it's up to every individual government to, to, to open up. So in this case, um, uh, we, we would propose to reach out through, through the usual uh, channels uh, that, that the organizations have for getting in touch with their counterparts in the relevant ministries, right? So I would assume that that your your members have those uh, contacts, uh, probably in the ministries of economy, possibly in the ministries of education or labor, and and to to reach out and to check with them. And uh, one last uh, question that addresses uh, all the synergies for the current period. How can RRF support the private investment in skills and what is the link with InvestEU? Um, the, the, the principle of operation of the RRF in InvestEU is uh, fundamentally different. So uh, there is no explicit link, but what we will be always looking for is a coherent set of reforms and investments. So that means that if the member state is pursuing uh, a skills measure, we will want to take a look at what they're doing uh, through the EU funds, through the national budget, through the reforms. That's wh where, where I mentioned their link with the semester, because we see the challenge of a member state. So we want to see a whole picture. So uh, the InvestEU and the RF will not be directly linked, uh, but the, we will be looking for synergies. Um, and now, how would how could private investors be uh, directly contribute to the RF? 
um, uh, simply from from the organizational operational point of view uh, the, the RF is an arrangement between the European Union and the member state so there there will be no participation from individual organizations and then uh, the national rollout will depend on 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 the national uh, specificities so um, depending on how the member states arrange their their skills measures uh that uh, that that will affect the, the kind of contacts uh and contributions of the private investors we're sorry for this uh, uh generic answers but this is by design so we want the rf to really be tailored to to the specific needs of the member state great thank you very much and uh yeah we will also tackle all this uh, information more uh, in depth and in details in a future uh, uh, policy brief uh, that will be released in mid-april uh, so uh, no worries for our attendees, everything will be also clearly specified there. Uh, to close uh, the session, we have one last question for Anna. Um, how could social investors better integrate in the partnership uh, for innovation and are all the sectors eligible or is there a specific focus? Um, in the Pact for Skills, do I understand correctly the question? Is there uh, a partnership for innovation under Erasmus Plus? Ah, yes, sorry, yes, of course, yes. that's also what I talked about. So that's um, the right now. The, so uh, the partnerships for innovation uh, lot one. That is, uh, I mean, any organization that aims to to work on this can apply. At least um, it seems like uh, that. That, that would be possible. Of course, again, the organization needs to uh, be focused on cooperation between vocational education training or higher education and enterprises. For the blueprints, uh, we want to focus on the 14 ecosystems that were identified in the industrial strategy. And for those organizations that will want to work in those ecosystems, um, I mean, they will they will be able to apply for for the for the funds. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also to all the participants of today. Uh, you addressed all, all, all the question address were very, very good. Um, it was very interesting exchange of knowledge. I would say useful for all of us to, to better understand the mechanism of the Pact for Skills and the three main uh, sources of uh, funding available to support upskilling and reskilling. Uh, if I would uh, have a short conclusion and uh, as a recap of uh, what Marie explained today, uh, the Pact for Skills is the EU flagship initiative to mobilize resources flowing into investments in skills. It establishes a shared engagement uh, model among the various actors present in the area of skills, such as uh, companies, workers, national, regional and local authorities, uh, social partners, various actors there. Uh, the EU funding mechanisms uh, supporting the Pact uh, for Skills aim to enhance uh, cross-sector or public-private cooperation. All the takeaways from uh, our speakers uh, from DG Employment, from Luca, Anna and Lubomira, will be detailed, as I said, in the future EVP policy brief, so stay tuned. Uh, we intend to publish this paper in uh, mid-April, explaining the role of investors for impact, especially in supporting the Pact for Skills as well as the opportunities they can access, both non-financial and financial support through all the EU funding uh, opportunities that um, we tackled today, uh, ESF Plus, Erasmus Plus, and RRF. Uh, I would like to highlight very briefly now the role of investors for impact uh, that can, can play as they put the social consequences of, of their investments at the core of their investment decisions. So they can find um, within the framework of the Pact for Skills many opportunities to uh, invest and support areas such as lifelong learning, employability, social inclusion, and active citizenship to ultimately ensure future-proof careers and bring the real change um, into people's lives. One great example of this type of initiatives with the potential to be included under the Pact for Skills is uh, the case of Rethink Ireland's funds presented earlier by, uh, earlier by Jessica. Uh, on a final note, uh, we would like uh, to invite all of you to take a look at the charter of the Pact for Skills and uh, join this great collaborative opportunity. I would like also to remind you that uh, the recording of this webinar with all the slides will be available soon on our website. And finally, that a survey will pop up on your screen. 
uh, we will highly appreciate if you can give two minutes to fill it in, as it is a very good opportunity for us to better understand what are the policy topics that would be interesting for you, interesting for you to be addressed in the upcoming webinars. That's all for today. Thank you very much for your attending and uh, have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.